Thank you. Hi, so I want to talk to you guys about science, which to me is more than just biology, chemistry, and physics, but it's a way of looking at the outside world, understanding it and rationalizing it in hopes of making it a better place to live. And so I want to revolve my talk around the five main questions that we all learned to ask ourselves since elementary school. Who, what, when, where, and why? So first of all, who does science? And I really think everyone does science and this idea of exploration and asking questions and solving them, especially when we're young kids. Like when we're toddlers, we're picking up new objects and we're testing it and seeing how everything in the world works. But somewhere between that ripe young age and when we head off into high school, go into university, get a job, somewhere in between all that, we make a distinction between those who are researchers and scientists and other professions. And I hope I can prove to you guys by the end of my talk that there is no such distinction, that at heart all of us are true scientists. But to give you guys a more encompassing look at really who is involved in scientific research as we know it today, I'd like to compare it to a men's hockey team. So like coaches, we have mentors, professors, postdoc, and university students who are willing to give up their time and energy to guide us on the scientific methodology. Like teammates, we have fellow researchers who we like to collaborate with. I met many of my best friends through science, and it's always fun and always a very stimulating experience to share our research with others. And like we want the Chem men's hockey team to bring home the gold on Sunday, there are patients in hospital beds needing better treatments and just average people looking for better ways to live their lives. And so really what is scientific research and what does it look like? Well, you have a hypothesis and you figure out a way you can test that hypothesis and then you evaluate it and you realize you screwed up bad and then you learn from those mistakes and you restart that process all over again. But I want to talk about science in a more holistic sense. So imagine a region that encompasses all of mankind's knowledge. So it includes everything from Newton's Principia to the Constitution in our modern governance today. So that's pretty impressive. Like there's a lot of information in that bubble. But what surprises me more is that there's a lot more that we don't know. And the cool part is that research exists in that realm of the unknown. And this is really cool because this means when you're a researcher, you have the most freedom possible. You can ask yourselves whatever question to whatever interests you and take that step further by continually asking those important questions like why. So I started to do research when I was in grade nine and essentially a lot of close family members and I knew started a lot of people who got cancer. And so at that time it became a lot more of a personal dehabilitating disease and I was wondering why you know, we haven't found a cure for this in the midst of the 21st century, pumping in a lot of money to stop and find a cure for cancer, but where are we at now? So out of curiosity, I was looking on the internet and I realized that chemotherapy isn't sort of this medical miracle that we sometimes hear about it on the news. And so, in fact, I found out that chemotherapy is a very detrimental process. So I was trying to figure out how can we alleviate the strain that we place on cancer patients. So I came across two completely different papers. On one hand, I came across a paper from the 1970s, so completely before my time. But essentially, what these researchers found out 40 years ago was that cancer cells die at 42 degrees Celsius, whereas regular cells die at 48 degrees Celsius. So that's really interesting, because here is a way you could kill off the cancer cells without harming the rest of the body. And I was wondering why that was being used as a conventional form of ther therapy. And then I came across another paper. It just popped on my Facebook news feed, and essentially it was talking about these researchers in Silicon Valley who are using nanoparticles, these really small particles that are a million times smaller than the grain of sand, and using them in solar panels. Because these nanoparticles are smaller than the wavelength of oncoming light, they had extraordinary optical properties. So then I thought, why don't we combine these two ideas, right? Why don't we use these nanoparticles who have these incredible optical properties, have them target cancer cells, irradiate laser light upon it, and then cause cell death. So that idea was known as photothermal therapy, and I really wanted to test that idea out. So I wrote up a research proposal, and I sent it out to a whole bunch of professors in the field. And sadly, I got a whole bunch of rejections in return. But thankfully, a postdoctoral student at the University of Calgary took me under her wing. And starting at the University of Calgary, I started to learn more about mathematical modeling using MATLAB and a lot of high-tech physics to virtually simulate what this type of treatment would look like. 
what would happen if you had a nanoparticle that it had to interact with laser light and essentially see how effective and viable they would be in real life. And so with those results, I once again wrote up a new research proposal and I sent it out to a bunch of professors. And one contact led to another and I found myself under the mentorship of Dr. Cram and Dr. Trudell at the University of Calgary. And here it was really exciting because now I could use real life nanoparticles. These things are so cool. You have to look through them through an electron microscope. And I just found it so cool that the smallest of particles could potentially hold the solution for the biggest of problems. And that to me at the time was really exciting. Except what I then realized was that in the, when you're using photothermal therapy, some types of cancer, they have a defense mechanism. They upregulate these protein called heat shock protein to protect itself from this type of treatment. And so last year, I looked at ways you could knock down this defense mechanism. So I went back to what I did in grade nine and I set up computer models and I tested out the effects of various antibiotics on the heat shock protein and try to find a way you could inhibit that expression so that you could knock down that defense mechanism. And so I found an antibiotic, 17 ag But my original quest problem was that there was no way I could target the cancer cells individually. So I solved that problem by using nanotechnology, but then I got a defense mechanism exhibited by the cancer cells, but then I overshot that problem by using an antibiotic. But now I had to make sure that both the nanoparticle and the antibiotic target the cancer cells simultaneously. So I found this type of technology known as a libosome, which has a dual region loading capabilities. Essentially, in its aqueous core, you could store the gold nanoparticles, and in its fat soluble bilayer, you could store the antibiotic. So using this type of technology, I actually got to see some really incredible results. This is a form of cancer therapy that wasn't limited to any strain of cancer, but had a limitless possibility. But understand that I'm only at the surface, and I haven't even scratched that. There's a lot more experiments that I need to run, and a long journey ahead. But it's a journey I look forward to, just because for the simple reason that science is fun. It's a lot of fun having those questions, being able to do those experiments by yourselves, and seeing the answers to those things that have been bugging you. But moreover, they say that knowledge is power, but I like to think that research is empowerment. Research actually allows you to take those visions and ideas in your head and actively shape the world around you, which I think is a very fulfilling feeling when you come to think of the possibilities of actually helping people across the world. But I think there's another reason too why I like science so much. And it's because as a youth, I understand that I'm not unique in this regard. I think all of you guys, especially in this room, are capable of having that same sort of scientific inquiry. I've had incredible experiences from presenting at the National Research Council to going with my buds and representing Team Canada at the Intel ISAF in Phoenix. And through that, I realized that, you know, youth, we're really creative people. And essentially, there's some scientific backing towards this. So a brain, it has many different types of brain waves, one of them being a theta type brain wave, which is between the four to seven hertz uh, frequency. And so brain, these theta waves are experienced during often meditative states, and they're associated with creative thought. Now adults, they really experience these types of brain waves in very unique situations, like between sleepfulness and waking up. But adolescents, so us, we experience this on a much more regular occurrence. So innately, we're creative. But there's another thing too. I think all of us are creative. Sometimes we see this misconception that some people are just creative and some people are just rational and mathematical in their way of thinking. But here's a picture of the brain in which the green regions encode for creative thought, whereas the red areas are associated with logical thinking. So understand that there is no really right brain, left brain split, that all of us are able to be creative. But even if there was a right brain, left brain split, that you know, some of us are creative and some of us are, log are logical, there's this type of structure in the brain called the corpus callosum, and essentially I believe it's the manifestation of what science is. So it connects both the right and the left brain, and according to traditional way of thought, that's combining logic with creativity. And essentially that's what I believe science is. It's that congregation of mathematical reasoning and logic with that creative artistic drive you see in artists. And so, but I think there's something also more cool though. Right? Because I think it's our generation that's going to be able to have the most impact on our world today. And I think that's because we have a closer understanding of what it really means to be human and what it really means to be a scientist. So previously you would compare human beings to animals and you try to figure out what really separates humans from other subsets of animals. And essentially you may think it's because maybe we can communicate better, we can form social groups or have higher level thought. But new study shows that you know, mammals like dolphins and elephants experience those same characteristics. 
So understand that the position, possession of those characteristics alone don't define as being human. But I think that there's another species we can compare ourselves to living in the 21st century, and that being technology. And so, first of all, I like to think of human beings as we are innately, we can be motivated. We can do things because we want to. Animals, they operate on instinct and they look towards on basis of survival. And machines, they're pieces of hardware, they don't want to do anything unless we push the power button, right? But we can do things because we want to, because we're really inspired and we're really motivated. And that's the impetus for change. And for the fortunate, where we have food on our table, water running through our taps, and a roof on our shoulders, we don't have to worry about survival, but we can actually put our interest where those interests lie and actually push forward on the boundaries of science. So I urge you all guys to find what motivates you and what really inspires you. But moreover, I think that human beings, we're the ones responsible for innovation. You take a look at computers, they exist in that tiny realm of no knowledge, right? You can only have a computer that does what we program it to do. But human beings, we exist in the same region of the unknown as research exists. We're able to be innovative and creative. So I urge you all not only to find your passions, but be innovative in those fields. And finally, mistakes. If you have a math problem, you can Wolfram Alpha it, put it in your TI-83, and come up with the right answer every single time. But human beings, we're going to make mistakes. But that's a good thing, because as the saying goes, you're going to learn from those mistakes. So intrinsically, as human beings, we're going to have two avenues of learning, from our successes and from our failures. We have an exponential learning curve, so don't be afraid of making mistakes. Because if you're pushing on the boundaries of science, if you're pushing on the frontiers of whatever your interests lie, you're going to make mistakes, and that's a good thing. So at the end of the day, I urge all of you guys to explore. Whatever your interests are. Like if you're a writer, don't write the same old boring romance vampire novel, but actually write a piece of literature that broadens human thought. And if you're interested in history, don't just read textbooks and regurgitate the information, but actually analyze and debate it and maybe get involved in local politics. If your interest lies in sports, be a Patrick Waugh and revolutionize goaltending or be a Dr. J and revamp the slam dunk in basketball. And if you are interested in sciences, don't just listen to your teachers yap about it, but truly experience it because that's where the true beauty lies and that's where we are going to see some great advancements in mankind today. So if all of us in this room can do that, I'm really excited to see where this will be in 50 years or so. Thank you for your time. It's been my pleasure.